Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ragesh Tongri, and I'm the president of the Historical Society for the Northern District. I'm very pleased to welcome you all here. Thank you for coming. I think you're going to find this is time well spent. We have an excellent program. I've got a few preliminary announcements. First, on the handouts you picked up on your way in, there's a green page on the back. We would very much appreciate your filling in that green sheet and turning it in at the front desk on your way out. If you, if you could spare a moment to do that, we would appreciate it. Second, I'd like to let everyone know that we have a reception after the program, so please come out and join us in the corridor for, for a reception and to say hi to our panelists and fe your fellow attendees. It should be very nice. Third, I would like to say that um, you have your books, to the extent you ordered a book, has been inscribed already or signed already by Judge Alsop. But if you would like a personal inscription, he'll be out in the corridor as well after the program. And he would be more than happy to put a personal message in the book for you if you would, if you would like that. So stop by and see him. And there may be a bit of a queue, but he'll do his best and he'll, he'll get through everybody, I'm sure. And then I have the privilege of introducing our panelists today. I'm going to go in, I think, reverse alphabetical order and starting from on this side, we have Leah McGarrickle. Leah is a reformed lawyer, uh, still has a license, but she's progressed to being an oral historian. She has, among other, uh, other great tasks, con completed the oral histories for both Judge Henderson and Judge Alsop. So she knows them better than they know themselves, perhaps, and she's well suited to be the master of ceremonies for today's program. Next, we have Judge Henderson, who, of course, needs no introduction, a former judge of this district with a long and wonderful career here, presiding over many, many important cases, including not a few uh, that dealt with, in so, if you, one way or another, legacies of the civil rights era and the civil rights laws and, and uh, helping folks bring themselves into compliance with those laws, even here in San Francisco over the decades. And then last but not, certainly not least, the guest of honor, Judge William Alsup, of course, still a very active judge in our district, who has written, somehow has found the time while presiding over a very full docket, he once in a while has a trial that you may hear, hear about, like Waymo versus Uber or something minor like that. And nevertheless, while doing that, has found time to set down his thoughts and reflections on a tumultuous and fascinating era and journey. And I'm looking forward to hearing and learning more about it. So I will turn it over to our panel. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Is it, am I, and we're working with the mic there? Can you hear? No. No. Louder. I might need help. Where did Stefan go? Okay. There we go. Any better? All right. Thank you. I'll do my best. If, if you can't hear or if it's too loud, give me a shout out, please. I want to thank Regesh Tongri so much for that warm introduction. And I want to give a special shout out to Judy Stoiko, who I know has been working uh, day and night. <laughs> to put together this program and so many uh, of the logistics that come along with it. So um, thank you both. It's wonderful to be here in the Honorable Felton E. Henderson Ceremonial Courtroom. My family and I were here the day it was dedicated. And of course, celebrating the publication of Judge Alsop's memoir, One Over. I know we have a lot of former law clerks here, and I'd like to ask you to raise your hand if you're a former law clerk of Judge Alsip or Judge Henderson. All right, and keep your hands up. Are you? And a former law clerk of uh, anybody, uh, our judges in the district, current and past. All right, and a former law clerk elsewhere. Great, and, and then our judges who are not from the Northern District. Do we have judges not from the, great. Well, thank you so much, welcome. I know it's a huge effort to get here. I, I understand some of you came from the East Coast. 
it's a huge effort if you come from the San Francisco Bay Area. So thank you so much for being here. And as I look out and see familiar faces, I want to say that how grateful I am to the Northern District Court Historical Society for bringing us all together in one room. Um, many of you I email with throughout the year. Maybe I dare to pick up the phone to impose a phone call on you, and maybe we get together every year or two. So. This is a huge occasion to be together in one room. So thank you again to the Northern District Court Historical Society. I want to welcome the judges back from two different road trips. They were on last week in uh, Mississippi, Alabama, part of the country. I think Judge Alsop started in New Orleans and went to Jackson and back to New Orleans. And Ole Miss. Old Miss. Old Miss. And a program at the University of Mississippi. That's Old Miss. Old Miss. Not Mississippi State University, where the judge went. And we were both there. You were both yeah. at Old Miss last week and a panel discussion similar to ours tonight. And uh, so I had a chance to watch a video of that. It was a, kind of in, in preparation, part of the preparation for tonight. So. I want to start by asking Judge Henderson something you said that struck me about your time in Mississippi last week. And it related to being in the hotel, checking into the hotel, and that experience you had in the lobby when the desk clerk said to you and your wife, Maria, here are the keys to your room. Yeah, well, it was, uh, uh, for background, uh, you have to realize that it was 56 years since I had been in Mississippi and Alabama when I worked for the Justice Department. And uh, at that time, I, I, I remembered when I walked into the hotel that the last time I had tried to get into a hotel was in 1963 when my boss, John Doerr, was staying at the Hilton Hotel and asked me to drop off some very important papers. and. Uh, I thought I was going to get lynched for even trying to walk through the front door. And I had to end up driving down the street and calling him to come outside the hotel to get them. So it was very emotional to walk in and just walk in the hotel and uh, see white people and black people there. It was, I knew this was happening intellectually, but to feel it after that, my last time there was very emotional for me. And uh, I was uh, amazed at all the things I saw. I was a bit worried, uh, even going down there, which I discussed with Judge Alsop. Uh, my wife, as many of you know, is Hispanic, and I was thinking, what's going to happen with an interracial couple and we're driving along? So I was very nervous about it all, but mm -hmm. uh, the, the reception was fine. The, uh, there were blacks and whites eating in the dining room, and uh, I very quickly uh, relaxed and uh, adjusted to 2019 instead of uh, 1963. Right. Well, I know that, uh, as many people here do, that you were born in Louisiana and that your family came to California when you were three years old and you ended up in South Central LA before you came up to Cal on a football scholarship. Right. But I recently learned that you have family roots going back to Mississippi and you had stories you heard growing up about yeah. your grandmother and your mother in Mississippi. Yeah, yeah the family roots are in Mississippi, uh, Butte, Mississippi, uh, Bill. Uh, used to hear stories about Butte. My mother went to school there. My grandfather was a minister there. My grandmother was we call her a church lady there. All my uh, eight uncles and aunts all grew up or were born in Butte, Mississippi, which is a small, small town in uh, Mississippi. And I wanted to try to get to Butte, but uh, our schedule was too tight, and we never actually got to, uh, to get there. But the roots go back there, and as growing up, I heard of many, many stories uh, about growing up in Butte. My mother would tell me about her education there, she would go to school, and in those days, uh, uh, when cotton picking time came, the black school kids would uh, turn in their school books and get a cotton bag and go out and pick cotton. And I don't know if they got a grade on that or what uh, for the school, but uh, those were the kind of stories I associated with uh, Butte, Mississippi. 
Now, if you take us back a little bit to your arrival as a young attorney working for the Justice Department, Civil Rights Division, the first African-American attorney in, in the um, Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, I think there were only maybe a little bit more than a dozen attorneys mm -hmm. overall, not like today. Um, that first assignment when you're sent back uh, by Robert Kennedy and Burke Marshall and John Doerr to the South, what tell us some of the impressions you had early on in mm -hmm. that that first few months, for example, there? Uh, well, it took a while. They, they weren't sure whether it was safe to send me out. So I worked in Washington at a desk job doing research on voting rights cases uh, and helping other attorneys prepare for trial uh, while they tried to figure out whether it would be good, uh, safe for me to go out and, uh, you know, and, and uh, be a government lawyer and how I would be treated. But finally, we decided to do it. And uh, my first trip uh, was a disaster. Uh, they sent me to Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And I should explain by way of background that the Kennedys, uh, the President Kenny, Kennedy was president, his brother uh, Bobby was the attorney general. They had decided the meager resources that we had in the Civil Rights Division. Uh, when I joined it in 62, the, the division had only been created in 1957. So by 1962, they only had 37 lawyers, very small uh, office for a government, uh, uh, for a division of the Justice Department. And they decided the best way to use us was on voting rights cases. And they divided us into three uh, states, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And I happened to be born in Louisiana, so they assigned me to the Louisiana division. So my first trip uh, was to Shreveport. And I flew into the airport and uh, rented the car and uh, got in the car and headed for Shreveport on this big new highway they had, very wide highway. And uh, after about 20 minutes as I was driving, I uh, realized I was so nervous I had forgotten my luggage. I just got the car and started <laughs> driving uh, to Shreveport. So on this big wide highway, I swung around and started heading back to the airport. And in a few minutes, I saw a red light uh, behind me. And it turned out that I'd never been on a highway this wide. This was a one-way highway that seemed like 20 <laughs> lanes. So I was going the wrong way. And the guy was pretty rough on me, but he also may have saved my life. But, but, but uh, anyway, he pulled me over and uh, 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 got out, had a gun, and said, put your hands up against there. You got a, a knife on you, boy? You got a gun on you? And uh, once he saw I wasn't uh, uh, dangerous, I didn't carry a weapon, I was wearing a suit, uh, he, we started talking. And I told him I was from Berkeley. And he says, oh, uh, this will uh, uh, make you feel good, Bill Orrick, Jr. Uh, he said, <laughs> uh, you have the Oakland police case. He said, oh, I used to be on the Oakland police force. Uh, and uh, that informed me a lot about uh, my, my police case later on, that there were guys like that on the uh, police force. But anyway, uh, he gave me a ticket, uh, and I still have it, a copy of the ticket. Uh, uh, it had on there, reckless, uh, R-E-K-L-E-S-S, -S, and careless, C-A-R-L-E-S-S. -S. And... Uh, I paid my fine. I was so embarrassed about it, I didn't even report it to John Doerr and my bosses because I figured they'd probably never let me go back down again if I got arrested on my first trip. But anyway, that was my introduction to uh, traveling around in the South. And uh, was, well, it certainly speaks um, in a very profound way to the danger of having a gun put, put to you. Yeah. I wanted to fast forward several decades to you as a federal judge in the courtroom down the hall from where we are today. And a motion, I, the way I understood you say it was a suggestion for a motion for recusal. I'm not sure about the suggestion part. Could oh. you share that story with us? Yeah, right. Uh, one of my first 
cases, uh, I got a document uh, uh, entitled Suggestion of Recusal. And uh, I read it and uh, uh, said, well, we'll go out and hear it. We took the bench and uh, uh, had the attorney uh, make his presentation. And after he discussed it a bit, I said, well, let me get this straight now. You're saying that I ought to recuse myself because uh, this is a, 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 a discrimination case. It's a black suing a white, is that right, or suing a, a group of whites. And he says, that's correct. And you think that I can't be fair on that kind of a case because I'm black. Is that, is that right? Yes, that, that's right, sir. And he's smiling. He says, oh, you're getting it. Uh, <laughs> and I said, okay, well, let's see. Let's think this through. Uh, if I recuse myself, it's going to go to one of my colleagues. Is that the way this works? Yeah, that's right. And they're all white. Is that right? Yes. Then tell me why the hell you think they can be fairer. And it went downhill from there. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I ended up uh, referring it actually to another colleague who uh, decided it for me and decided that I could be fair on this. But that was my introduction. And I had a couple of other, not another motion, but a, some suggestions of that nature in terms of my ability to hear certain kinds of cases. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to segue to a story that Judge Alsup tells, and it's the first story in, in the book one over. I just want to read a couple of sentences from the last paragraph of the first chapter, which is called Looking Back. In the quiet of my chambers in San Francisco, I pause to reflect on my youth in Mississippi, the tumult of the civil rights movement, and how those years affected my attitudes on the monumental issues of race and equal justice. The right thing to do was to deny the lawyer's request. Growing up white in Mississippi, I say in a brief ruling, opened, not closed my eyes to the cruelty of racism. And so we have a, a situation which is the flip side of the coin that Judge Henderson described. I wonder if you could talk, speak to that, Judge Alsup. It was 2011, and I, probably the same type of case that Judge Henderson was referring to as a, was a Title VII case. And on that record, I ruled against the African-American plaintiff. The lawyer then made a motion for me to be disqualified, which I referred out to someone, and it was denied. Mm -hmm. uh, it was based on the ground that I was a white guy raised in Mississippi and was ingrained with res residual racism. So then the lawyer uh, made the same motion, but directed to me personally to recuse myself. So this is one that, uh, uh, since it had already been referred out to a judge, I figured I should rule on myself. And I, I understood where that lawyer was coming from. We were both old enough to have lived that, through that era. And I, you know, I did not, uh, it, it was hurtful, believe me, it was hurtful, but it ne nevertheless, it was something that I felt deserved a uh, proper reply, so I reflected on it. And at the end, uh, I wrote, wrote a short order saying just what you, what you just read. But that was one of the impetuses for me eventually deciding about that same time to uh, put down in writing uh, how coming of age in Mississippi during, at a time when the civil rights movement was exploding all around us, uh, how that did affect my attitudes. I've been asked that a lot over my life, so it gave me the occasion to put it in on paper. Yeah, that just reminds me of, a, of an anecdote, which is when you got to Harvard. We, we don't have time to talk about this today, but when you got to Harvard, some of those classmates might have uh, been a little bit suspicious of, of you coming from Mississippi. Well, it was very true. Now, remember, I got to Harvard in 1967 to go to law school, and uh, a white guy coming from Mississippi was automatically suspect. I wanted to have a roommate. 
because I figured that was a good way to meet somebody. I didn't know us, you know, I was lucky to get in. I, had, I knew zero people. So I said, if I get a roommate, then I'll have one friend automatically. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, the guy was from New York. And he was apoplectic when he learned that his roommate <laughs> was going to be this white guy from Mississippi. So he went to the, I learned all this later, he went to the housing office and protested. And to their credit, they said, no, you're stuck with this guy. So he came back and, and he wouldn't talk to me for two days. He kept his door closed and and uh, well, I was too stubborn. I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna not knuckle under to that. I said, "Look, I got nothing to apologize for, so I am. Uh, I'm not gonna. Uh, you know, if he wants to be that way, I could be that way too." <laughs> However, I, I, I came to Harvard with a, a duffel bag that had about three items of clothes and a guitar. And so one night I got the guitar out and I was playing it. Well, he heard me through the door. He played the guitar too. And he had his guitar. So he said, are you playing that guitar? And I said, yeah, I am. He said, I like that. And so he brought his guitar out. And we played a few tunes together. And we became very good friends. So that was Well, the, that uh, is a great story and uh, about music uh, breaking down barriers. So and we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the important uh, musical figures of the era later. And I don't know if some of you came in early. Did you hear the music? Yes, great, because uh, there was some special music arranged for you to hear. Well, let's talk about the Mississippi way of life, quote, unquote, and, uh, and maybe particularly for some of the younger people in the group who, who aren't going to be as familiar about what that meant, institutionalized racism and segregation and de facto and, and then so on. I was born in Mississippi in 1945, so I'm a true... Uh, post-war baby. Actually, I was born before the war even ended in Japan. And the, I grew up there uh, all through the 50s, went to segregated school systems. And I, so I know what the, the system was like. The, it was totally segregated for almost all things. Socially, it was definitely segregated. Education was segregated. Uh, uh, African Americans could not eat in a restaurant unless it was a, a black-only restaurant. Uh, same thing on, on uh, motels and hotels. Employment, uh, employers had every right under the law as it then existed to refuse to hire anybody they wanted. So uh, uh, blacks were uh, not hired for the kind of jobs that whites were hired for. Uh, it was a very class caste system. Uh, most uh, uh, so so African Americans worked for uh, either for families as domestic help or laborers. In almost all cases, there was not a single police officer or fireman who was African American. Uh, the and, and when you say institutionalized, that was very true. The law. The police, the churches, the schools, all were aligned to support segregation. And the newspaper, that we had one big newspaper in Mississippi. It was called the Clarion Ledger. It was, it was uh, vehement against uh, the Kennedys, against the federal government. It uh, protested regularly something that the federal government had done, and, the, and certainly the Brown v. Board of Education decision. So all of the institutions were set up to, oh, I left a big one out, voting. Voting. African Americans, in theory, could vote. But if an African American went down to register, they would lose their job at a minimum. At a minimum. They might lose their life. Their house might get bombed. So. African Americans did not vote. They were not allowed to vote. So here we have a system under which Mississippi, even today, has more African Americans per capita than any other state in the Union. And in Mississippi, even today, there are many counties where the African American population is the majority. But in those days, there were no black officials elected because, why? They, blacks could not vote. 
So this was a, uh, a really a, a terrible system that was in place, not just in Mississippi, but all through the all through the South. And as I as as you grow up, as I grew up in that system, I came to hear it referred to euphemistically as the quote Mississippi way of life. If if you question something, that's oh that's just the Mississippi way of life, and we we have to accept that. So that's that's a, that's a very short version. Uh, it was it was a cruel system, a violent system when it when uh, uh, necessary to, to maintain it, and. Uh, for someone like Judge Henderson to go down there, he was, I, I don't care what the Kennedys thought, he was in great danger uh, when, when he was there uh, because he was black and because he was on the civil rights side of history. And, and there were lots of people who probably, uh, if they'd had a half a chance, would have killed him. That's the Mississippi way of life, as it existed in 1963. Mm -hmm. You talked also about this is relating to education about textbooks and the oh, yeah. the educational. Uh, if any of you read that chapter, you'll see uh, the Ku Klux Klan was portrayed in the textbook that we were given in the, the for Mississippi history. The Ku Klux Klan was portrayed as a benevolent society formed to uh, protect widows and orphans. That's ridiculous, of course. Uh, but that's the way it was portrayed in the in the Mississippi history book. There's more, a lot more to it. But uh, we were, it was propaganda. Propaganda was a, an important part of the growing up process. We learned out of those kind of textbooks, and then all the blanks were filled in by the Clarion Ledger, the, the statewide newspaper, who regularly put out a uh, through several columnists an anti-Kennedy, anti-federal government, pro-South, pro-Confederacy pro point of view. You had some friends, a lot of friends growing up, who were lifelong friends. One was Ron Goodbread, who sadly passed away not too long ago, and who, from a very young age, was a Lincoln scholar. I mean, I think it's a little bit hard to imagine today how being a Lincoln scholar from a young teenage teenage man could have been controversial, but um, it was in, in that place and time, and it sounds like he not only digested all of Lincoln's, or the books about Lincoln, the Sandberg series you mentioned, but he spoke to you and your friends about about Lincoln. Can I, uh, I think it would, uh, if I can tell the billboard story, that yeah, would, uh, that would illustrate the, uh, mm -hmm. I have, by the way, uh, I have some artifacts here. This is my diary from, from that era. Uh, and then this is my journal that I kept in college. And I've got some uh, newsletter things that, from some of those events that I happened to observe and actually even be part of at that, at, at that time. The billboard story is, is, uh, came about because of Ron. We were seniors in high school. It was the day February 6, 1963. I think you were in Jackson about that time. I, I remember uh, some of those events. We didn't know each other then. Felton's uh, much, for, not much, but a little bit farther ahead than me. And, and I was just a kid in high school, and he was a young lawyer there. But I remember some of those events. Anyway, February 6, 1963, my friend Ron and I got worked up because of a billboard that the John Birch Society had put up right outside of Jackson. Most of you are too young to even know what I'm talking about. But it said, impeach Earl Warren. And at the top there was a banner that said, save our republic. That was what they, you know, that was what the John Birch said, save our republic, impeach Earl Warren. And then on the left side, there was a big American flag. This is a huge billboard, well lit at night. Just one coming into the city of Jackson on Highway 80. So Ron and I drove out there in the afternoon to look at it because we just heard about it. And he was a Lincoln scholar. I gotta pause a minute to explain what that meant there. He was a Lincoln scholar. He knew who had won and lost the Civil War. He had great respect for the federal institutions, including the Supreme Court. And that's where the sign really got him irritated because impeach Earl Warren, that was a direct frontal assault on a federal institution that Ron had great respect for. Well, I, 
took my history from Ron at the time. I was not well read, he was well read. I, I was just his tag along guy. And he got worked up and, and so we decided we would go paint over the impeach Earl Warren part. So uh, we went to my house and to see if we had any leftover uh, house paint. And we uh, found two cans. It mixed together as beige. We put it in the back of my mom's 1954 Chrysler brown and tan sedan and waited for dark. Then I called Ann. My wife Susan has met Ann. Ann was, I was very, I was trying to impress uh, Ann at the time. She was a year behind me. I said, Ann, we're going to go out and here's what we're going to do. So I thought she would be impressed, but she said, can I come too? <laughs> uh, this, now I was stuck. Because I could have come up with a convenient excuse not to go through with this, but now she wanted to go. So we picked her up on the way out there, and, and we went parked on the gravel road behind the sign, and we uh, run. I said, Ann, you got to stay in the car, so because I didn't want her to get in trouble. And then uh, all the conspiracy law would have picked her up, I guess. But, <laughs> So we went, Ron and I uh, went commando style through, then we cut off a big branch of the pine tree, and then Ron got up on the top of the two cans from the back, and I guided him over the impeach Earl Warren part. Meanwhile, their car is whizzing by like this uh, down below, and so Ron pours down can number one, and I smear the impeach Earl Warren part up, but it wasn't enough. I said, we need the second can, so he pours that down. We smear that up, and then we just jumped in the car. We threw everything down, jumped in the car, and got out of there. This was at night now, and, and then as we, were, as we were leaving, highway patrol cars converged on the scene. So we got out of there. If we had been a minute later, my life would have taken a different turn. <laughs> 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 so we got out, and, uh, and, and no one ever uh, apprehended us on this, and, but it was all over the news. It was all over the news, and Ann and I were scared to death, but Ron, he was dismissive of the system. He thought they were, they were not smart enough, they could never catch us. Uh, and, and, it, and, and just, I wrote my entry in the diary of this, I wrote it in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Figuring the police would be unable to read it. So, so uh, the... Uh, Anyway, they didn't catch us, but my mom came to me. She said, Bill, my dad had died by that point. Uh, uh, she said, Bill, did you paint up that sign? Well, I couldn't lie to my own mom. So I said, yes, I did. She said, well, you better be careful. That's all she ever said. Anyway, it blew over. And that, I, I, I tell this story because I was blessed to have friends like Ron who, although that sounds like he could have gotten me in trouble, but he, <laughs> he, he could see through the, 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 he could see through the evilness of the system he did, and it, much quicker than I, and I did. And so thanks to, to him and a few other friends, I, uh, I managed to slowly move over as the book details to the right side of history. And that issue of reprisals that you brought up earlier was very real. For example, for your mom, if something had happened yeah, to you, I, for Judge Henderson, yeah. similarly, and others. Uh, yeah, I, I, Judge Henderson would have been in much more trouble than me, but they, they would have put me in jail, but uh, I don't think my life would have been in danger, but Judge Henderson's very life would have been in danger. You referred earlier to being uh, in Jackson at about the same time, but different stages of your lives, and... Um, Judge Henderson, I believe, went to a fairground. And the Justice Department, did they send you to a fairground to inspect the conditions yeah. for some of the protesters who were being held there? And I think, Judge Alsop, you read about that in the newspaper. I did. Yeah, that was uh, oh, the bigger, big arrest. There were demonstrations uh, in, in uh, Jackson, and uh, they were arresting all of these young people that were coming in. and. The jails were filled up, so they started making the fairground, this big fairground, into a prison and detaining them there. And they sent me out to uh, uh, look at it and see 
we were getting rumors of kids getting beat up and things happening. So I went to inspect that. And again, that was a test of uh, whether I, as a black man, could go out there and wield any authority and all. But uh, fortunately, uh, they didn't oppose it. Uh, they uh, took me around and I uh, talked to some of the kids. I don't think I talked to the ones that had complaints about it. Uh, but it was, uh, it was unwieldy and I could see just from walking around that there was no way to properly house and take care of these kids. But I went through the, uh, uh, the grounds with the warden and a couple of other people and I ended up giving a report uh, back to Washington that this uh, seemed to not be an adequate uh, place to imprison uh, people. And uh, they negotiated uh, with uh, the jailers and they improved the conditions. But it was a, a very unlikely situation. Just kids sleeping on the ground and blankets on the ground and a very messy situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I know there are a lot of overlapping circles um, in, in the parallel stories um, from both of you at this point in time, but maybe we could talk about Medgar Evers. And I know later on Judge, Judge Alsop had an opportunity after Medgar Evers was killed to meet with his brother Charles Evers to express his condolences. Yeah. But maybe you could speak some to what it was like to be there with people like Medgar Evers. Oh, it was, uh, uh, I have to say something. Some of you have heard me talk before. I put a lot of pressure on myself uh, by seeing people like Medgar Evers, Martin Luther King, and the kids who, you know, didn't have the... Uh, the security of having a card they could whip out of an oppressive looking card and saying I'm with the Justice Department, which kept me out of a lot of tough things. But I also at the same time being able to do that and seeing uh, the citizens expose themselves to real dangers and, and go knowing they were doing it. For example, the kids who were marching would come to the march knowing they were going to be arrested and they'd have their tooth bag, uh, toothbrushes wrapped in a little face towel and in their pants or their overalls, knowing it. And that kind of bravery made me feel like a real coward. You know, I felt, you know, well, I'll whip out my thing and nobody will bother me. And I felt I needed to uh, step up a little more. And uh, uh, so uh, I uh, started challenging the system a little more. Well, I'll tell the story about Jackson, that uh, uh, one of the things I uh, almost did that would have gotten me uh, uh, in as much trouble as it was when I loaned the car to Martin Luther King. It was a big day that uh, Medgar Evers had uh, organized in Jackson at, I think it was the Elks or the Moose Club. Do you remember the name of the big black club there on on on, uh, on that street that I was looking for. Uh, I don't. I it's don't. an Elks Club, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and uh, he'd gotten Lena Horn, uh, Harry Belafonte was there, James Baldwin. It was a huge event. And uh, the place was absolutely packed. And uh, after everyone speaking, uh, it was a fundraiser. And they uh, asked for people to donate money, write checks, give cash. And people lined up on the sides of this big auditorium and went up the steps onto the stairs. And they had baskets along the way. And I saw that some of the little school kids go up. And some of them were barefooted. And they would give whatever hit. They're probably 37 cents. And they would drop it in. And I knew that was a huge amount for them. And I felt I just could not sit there and watch this. I'm supposed to be neutral, of course. But I was overwhelmed by the moment, and I actually got in line, and I was going to go up and give whatever I had in my wallet. And as I creeped up, uh, people were talking more and more, and I finally got to the steps. And 
came to my senses. And I said, nope, this will embarrass the department. It'll be on the front page of the Clarion <laughs> Ledger, and uh, it'll be exaggerated uh, beyond what I actually did, which would have been stupid. So I stepped back down. But I was always facing that crowd, and Dr. King was always uh, nudging me, too. You know, he would say things like, you know, Felton, the best thing you could do to help the movement uh, is get hit all up alongside your head by some cops. Uh, you know, he talked like that, and, uh, and he really meant it, and, uh, <laughs> because he would say that if, if, you, if they beat me up, a, a, an attorney for the Justice Department, you know they're going to, and it would give another lesson to the North, and he was trying to send the message of, of the Mississippi way of life, uh, to the rest of the world so they would see what was undergoing there. And I was trying desperately, if not bravely, to do my part to help on that. But uh, it, it was, I don't know if I've answered your Absolutely question. no, it was a conflict and you, a you've conflict spoken to sure. that and also um, separately to a, a point in time where there's a change in your thinking in terms of the way you then relate to Medgar Evers and, yeah. and others, maybe Dr. King as well. Yeah. Where yeah. they're um, looking at maybe to see if they can trust you with information. Yeah. yeah, when I first started, when I first went in the field, they, they, they thought maybe I was some Uncle Tom that the uh, department had gotten that was in there to really just spy on them. And so it was a little hands-off. And I still remember uh, the breakthrough. Uh, it was a dramatic change. We were at the A.G. Gaston Motel in Birmingham, which was the only place that blacks had to publicly, a public place that we could live. And so we were at the hotel, and uh, Dr. King and Andy Young and his staff, and we were outside in the courtyard there eating ice cream cones. It was a blistering hot day, about 85 or something. And we were talking about things, and I had the presence of mind to say, uh, you know, you guys shouldn't really tell me anything that you don't want Bobby Kennedy to know, because that's part of my job is reporting. Uh, and I could see them relax and say, look at each other and say, oh, he's for real, he's not trying to sneak in and, you know, counter espionage or anything. And things changed then, and then it really changed because they started giving me things that I could send to, uh, to Bobby Kennedy and tell him what he needed to know. Uh, and I began pushing my role a little more. I noticed over time that if uh, things were, if the black community was really going to arm itself or they were going to march and there was going to be a dangerous confrontation, the department was much more likely to act than if I said, well, people are angry, but it'll simmer off. Then they wouldn't do anything. And so I can say now, all of these years later, I would very often, if I thought it was a close enough possibility, I'd actually exaggerate my reporting and uh, maybe have a couple of blacks uh, arming themselves that really weren't arming themselves so that we would get more action from Washington. But we had this interaction uh, and uh, uh, as I said, we, we got a very close relationship uh, uh, until we finally got too close one night when I loaned Dr. King my car and all hell broke loose. So. And that was because Dr. King's car was, uh, was not uh, safe to travel at night in that right. part of the world, and that was, was a way to get him from it was point way, A to point B safely. Well, yeah, yeah, for those of you who may have seen the movie Selma, which involved Dr. King's years in Selma, uh, this was at that time, and he was conducting the Birmingham Children's Crusade but he was going to Selma several nights a week because Dr. King didn't just show up in town and say, here I am, we're going to start demonstrating. That isn't the way it worked. He had to warm the town up. He had to get people there. He could 
get people and know what the logistics were, who he could trust, and he was doing that from Birmingham to Selma, which was 70-something miles away, and this was one of the nights he was going to uh, Selma to speak at a church, and I was coming back to the hotel from a day out in the field working on a voting rights case, and as I was going into the hotel, he was being driven out of the hotel by a Reverend Vernon Smith, and we stopped and talked out of the window. I uh, can't remember what we talked about, but uh, after talking for about five or ten minutes, uh, I was going to go on in, and Dr. King said, uh, are you going to be using your car again tonight? And I was finished for the day, and I said no. And he said that uh, Reverend Smith uh, had a, a, a bad tire, bad rear tire. They were a little worried about it uh, getting to uh, Selma that night, and could they use my car? And I didn't hesitate to loan it to him. One, I didn't need it, uh, that was a reason, but also, and I was reminded of this driving that stretch last week, it's a long road through very dangerous country, uh, and uh, I thought nothing in the world would be worse than Dr. King breaking down on this road and the wrong people coming upon him, that would be the end of him. And so I didn't hesitate to uh, lend him my car, and uh, uh, the, uh, he was being followed, of course. There was a police car parked down the street uh, that saw that exchange. Uh, they uh, mistook... Uh, we drove in, and he got in my car, and Dr. S uh, Reverend Smith uh, drove to Selma, and they followed it. And the next day in the Birmingham newspaper, uh, there was a headline... Uh, which uh, said that uh, uh, I had driven him uh, to Selma, which I didn't. I had loaned him the car, but I have had high status as a judge for these many years, but I've never had as high a status as I had in the paper that day <laughs> because they had described me as a high-ranking government official and an intimate friend of President John F. Kennedy. Uh, that was what they put on the paper and made this a big explosive thing that deeply embarrassed the department uh, because they were trying to be neutral and hold on to the Democrats in the South, and this uh, didn't help the cause at all. Might be ultimately what helped bring you back to California uh, and, to the, and to where we are today. Um, Judge Alsip, we've talked a a lot about some of the influential influential experiences you had in college, um, the debate team, and the why. I know that's how you ultimately met your wife, Susan. Um, could you speak some to, to what those experiences meant to you and how they broadened your views? In the 60s, uh, people have forgotten this today, but in the 60s, the student YMCAs across the South and really throughout the entire country. Uh, my wife, Susan, w was active in the Y at UCLA. Uh, I, was act I became active in the student Y at Mississippi State, and that was as close to a radical as not, uh, just to a progressive, a mildly progressive organization on our campus was the student YMCA. So that, uh, for the last two years that I was at Mississippi State, which would have been 65 to 67, uh, I was very active and then wound up being the president of the student Y in the, my last year there. Uh, the the uh, Reverend Kermit Clardy was our faculty advisor and he was a very quiet person, but he, through the Socratic method, uh, caused a lot of us to uh, see the light, so to speak. So. And along with that, at that same time, or you're on the debate team and you're actually traveling by car out to the West Coast, see Harvard for the first time, Washington, D.C.? Yeah, I'd done very little traveling uh, out of Mississippi, and in those days, the air travel was just DC-3s and left over from World War II. Uh, we, uh, but we didn't use air travel. We traveled five people in a Rambler <laughs> all the way to Tacoma, Washington, mm -hmm. three weeks. 
we there, on that trip there were there were uh, five five of us all male, and we could only get four bed afford four beds, so two of us had to sleep together, and we drew straws, uh, and so that was the way we and we would drive all night to avoid having to. Uh, so, but we 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 were great. We out of something like three hundred and seventy teams, me and my partner came in second in that tournament. We should have come in first, but we came in second. <laughs> we came in second in that tournament. I was very proud of that. Uh, so through the debate team, uh, we became uh, the winningest uh, org sports organization, as, uh, or at least a forensic organization uh, on, on our campus. The football team was no good. The baseball team was mediocre. Basketball, same. So we, were, we got a lot of headlines in those days for going to tournaments and, and winning. And the influence that that had on me was learning the ability to make an argument and to anticipate the other side's arguments and to see the rest of the state, the rest of the United States. That was important. Uh, we were coming up against, for example, uh, integrated teams. Now today we just say, oh, that, no, what's a, in those days, that was a pretty big deal. We would participate, say, in the national tournament in Tacoma, Washington. There's plenty of integrated teams there. So uh, that, that was a new experience. But we took it, took it in stride, and we're not only in stride, we were, we were pleased that we had that opportunity, which we would, had not had before in, in, in Mississippi. So yeah, the debate team was an eye-opening experience for me. Now there's a point in, in college when you and, and Danny Cupid and, and some other people decide to challenge the speaker ban, which which prohibited having a, putting quotes, controversial speaker on any college campus in, um, in Mississippi. Yeah, this is the thing I'm the most proud of from my, my time there. And uh, unlike the billboard where I was uh, skulking around in the darkness, uh, this was all done in openness and uh, every, uh, uh, the, it, it, when I was a student at Mississippi State, and again, to give you the time, 1963 to 67, uh, coming into 66, there had never been an African American ever to give a speech at any, quote, white college in the entire state. Now you just think about that. Never. It, it never occurred. Well, at the Y, uh, we wanted to have a, uh, the pres state president of the NAACP come and speak. He was African-American. He was from Clarksdale and a pharmacist there. His name was Aaron Henry. Not Henry Aaron like the baseball player, but the other way around, Aaron Henry. And we wanted him to come and give a talk on whatever he wanted to, to speak on. Well, we put his name in because there was a regulation statewide that said the, they had to approve. Well, they said no. They said no, he's too controversial. What they really meant was, no, he's black. We're not gonna, and they, they said, we're not gonna have a black person come. Well, we knew that was a, the, the real reason. Uh, but, so we, at first, uh, let's, yeah, okay, we're putting up some, I was the president, so the YMCA protested this decision, and we wrote a, a long protest uh, letter. And, but meanwhile, my roommate and I, and, and he was with us at, uh, at Ole Miss uh, and, uh, last week, my roommate and I, he came up with the idea, let's bring a lawsuit. That's a pretty heavy duty thing for a young kid to think about. Let's bring a lawsuit. And so he was the president of the Young Democrats and I was one of his officers. And I said, okay, uh, I, I'll think about that. And we had a meeting uh, with the four of us who were members and, and the Young Democrats. And, we, uh, by the way, this was the progressive wing of the party, not the Jim Eastland, uh, uh, young Democrat type thing. That we were, we were more, we were the progressives, and we. Uh, it was a, it was not an easy decision because, uh, in fact, Frank Whittington's uh, dad said no way he would lose his job if he if we did that. I checked with my mom; she her job was safe. Uh, Danny's dad's job was in jeopardy, but he said. You go ahead and do it. Don't worry about me. Uh, there were other repercussions. Uh, I was very worried that they would take out the school would come down hard on the Y, even though it was the Young Democrats. 
So we got turned down, the Young Democrats got turned down, and Danny and I uh, uh, decided that we would go see the president and, and tell him that we were going to bring a lawsuit. Well, before that, I wrote a letter to the president of the university. Let's, can we get that up there and say, it's, uh, keep going. Uh, that's Danny's memo. I still have his memo where he proposes the lawsuit. That's in October 1966. And fast forward one more, another one. There we go. That's the letter that I wrote in October 1966 to the president of the university where I said we're going to sue in federal court because we think your speaker ban is unconstitutional. Uh, part of the reason I wrote this letter was to try to protect the Y, because I, I wanted to say the Young Democrats are going to do this, not the Y, because I was the president of the Y, and I didn't want to jeopardize the Y. But I, so I, I kept saying the Young Democrats, we're going to, Young so I was wearing two hats, really, and I wanted to say which hat I was, I was wearing. So it's a, it's a pretty nice letter. I'm proud of that letter. And I sent it to the uh, president, and uh, we then met with him, and he said, well, they, the Board of Trustees has tied my hands, and I, I can't do anything about it. He, but he took my letter to the Board of Trustees, and he said, they're going to sue us, these two students. And uh, we did, in fact, have a lawyer lined up in Greenville. He later went on to be on the Mississippi Supreme Court. But uh, at the time, he was just a young lawyer. And uh, he was going to represent us. Uh, and the Board of Trustees backed down, statewide Board of Trustees, not just for Mississippi State. They backed down and said, okay, this guy can come and speak. Well, we were thrilled. Uh, so let's go to the next uh, slide, the ne next one, and the next one. Here we go. So uh, it's a, Giles was named, this is the school newspaper that you can see it is Giles reversed himself and was going to allow Aaron Henry to come and speak. So in January 1967, he did come and speak, and we had a room uh, at the Y that was about this size, and it was jam-packed, and people were trying to get, we, we could hold 400, but uh, 750 wanted in. And the reason was it had gotten so much statewide publicity, we were regularly being reviled uh, in, the, in the Clarion Ledger uh, for uh, standing up to the system. And uh, we were getting a lot of criticism. So the, th the whole controversy had gotten so much press that it, everyone wanted to be there. So we had a huge turnout. So let's go to the ne next slide. Uh, that's Tom Etheridge, was the most racist columnist in America, probably. And we had to put up with him every single day. And he wrote many columns about me and Danny and the Y and the Young Democrats and this whole controversy. Uh, and that was statewide every day. Okay, let's let's go to the next one again. At next, there we go. So then, Aaron Henry uh, says, "Aaron Henry speaks here tonight." Well, on the night in question, we uh, he did come, and we had to uh, at the uh, thirty minutes before the event, we had run out of seats, so we had to get up there. I got up and said, "We're going to have to move this over to the big auditorium." They let us do it at the last minute. And so we moved it over to Lee Hall, and uh, we were walking with uh, Aaron Henry right over from the Y over to Lee Hall, and Danny and I were walking with him, and, uh, and then I realized mistake number one we had, because we walked right by a place where a guy had just been beaten up, one of our guests at the Y, he was from the Eleanor Roosevelt Foundation, and somebody had beaten him up there a few months earlier, and uh, uh, with Coke bottles, and we uh, and said, you know, we have done nothing to prepare for violence, zero. Fortunately, there was none. I mean, so we lucked out on uh, we lucked out on that. We got over there. Uh, the audience uh, was very uh, peaceful. We got over there. Danny was on the stage. He introduced Aaron Henry. Aaron Henry gave a great speech on the Voting Rights Act of 65, which at that point was brand new. It was in 60, January 67, and it had hardly taken effect. And so his speech was on what effect it will have. And all of the things he predicted came true eventually. It was an amazing, because the Voting Rights Act really worked, it worked great in Mississippi. It did just what it was supposed to do. Uh, African Americans registered to vote. And, and that's what Aaron Henry told us was going to happen that night. 
So he, he gave his speech, and here's the other thing we didn't think of, but fortunately some of the faculty did. There were some, uh, the faculty was very uh, cowed by the whole system. It took some courage for the, these four people to do what they did. But there were four people. One was uh, Sam Dudley in the speech department, and he sat down with three others on the front row center. And when the speech was over and everyone was clapping, those four stood to give a standing ovation. And at first no one else stood, but then slowly everyone in the rest of the room stood because they knew it was a historic moment. The first African American ever to give a speech at any quote white college in Mississippi. Uh, had just occurred. It was, it was a, it was a model of uh, what uh, uh, discourse in a in a time of tumult should be. Uh, it was totally peaceful. There was no one uh, uh, said any racist things. No one shouted out any. No one tried to sing Dixie. Uh, it was uh, it was a uh, really a, a remarkable event, and got a lot of good got a lot of good press. So that's the event that I look back on with. Uh, uh, the most satisfaction from, from that era. I found that just astounding reading, reading the memoir, how much um, you brought up the First Amendment in, in light of your young age uh, at the time when you and Ron Goodbread and Danny Cupid, who stayed in Mississippi as a lawyer, and, um, were just really coming up and what the First Amendment meant to you and how you were aware of the Constitution and in particular the First Amendment. Yeah, I think the, the two, two things are looking back on it that I probably carried away from those years. Uh, one is the extra, extra burden that people of color in our country carry in many different ways. I think I, I, think I learned that there. Uh, I know I did. And, and then the second is the special role of the right to petition the government for redress of grievance, and hand in hand with that is the right of protest, uh, which is a, another way to petition the government. Uh, that right is so important to make democracy work, because we all go to the polls and we vote and so forth. But if you're not informed about what the issues are and what it, some people are protesting, and, and they, they, they ought to have the right to bring to our attention what their grievance is. And that's the, that's the essence of the First Amendment. So I have a visceral respect for the First Amendment. Well, I could go on. Um, if, in case you're wondering, uh, Judge Henderson's interview is 30 hours. And uh, it is available um, through the library at UC Berkeley. Judge uh, Alsop's interview uh, will be available um, at some point in the future. And um, we had time to go more in depth. I would have loved to talk about Chicago and your experience hearing Dr. King, uh, Judge Alsop. Um, and, and of course, uh, so many more questions I would have liked to ask Judge Henderson. But we will stick to our time frame. I did have a couple of things I wanted to say in closing. Uh, one is um, Willem Baum started the Regional Oral History Office. Brandon, are you here today, her Willem's son? Brandon's my friend from growing up in Berkeley, also uh, a lawyer in this district. But Willa started the oral history office when the interviewers used reel-to-reel -reel tape back in the 50s and when UC Berkeley uh, did not deem it um, worthy of uh, serious uh, academic uh, funding or uh, really space or on a shoestring budget, she collected a huge number of oral histories. I was hired two years out of law school as a legal and political interviewer, and that's how I came to interview Judge Henderson, and that interview is part of the Northern District Court Historical Society interviews. So I want to thank the Northern District Court Historical Society again for our program tonight, for bringing us together today, for all the work you do, for the lawyers in this district, for our community, and for the oral history program uh, that you started so long ago. Judge Henderson, when we started working together, my daughters were small, and we were just reminiscing about this the other day. Anna went to her first grade teacher during sharing time to tell a story about how her mother was interviewing a judge of the world.
<laughs> and that story is in the oral history, it's in the transcript, it's in the audio, and uh, I just don't know, it can't be approved upon. So thank you for all you've done for me and my family all these many years. And Judge Alsip, when we first started working together, my daughters were already young women traveling the world to Nepal, Thailand, Big Bend National Park in Texas, where there's little to no water. And many times I've asked your advice and your guidance, and uh, both of you have just been there for us as a family, made a huge difference for us. And I, I know- I think your family should stand up. Uh, they're right <laughs> over there, let's- <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, and, and I know I speak for many, many people here tonight uh, as well. Um, in case any of you are wondering about leaving your law practice to become a legal oral historian, it's not practical in the Bay Area. <laughs> and I couldn't uh, be doing this work if it weren't for my husband, Phil, who's an IP lawyer, and who never wavered in saying, uh, when I'd come home, saying, you know, there's a new project on the horizon. Maybe I should get a real nine to five job. No, it was always a good idea. It was always of great value. And he knows how much I love the work. So thank you, honey. Um, and then I want to conclude by expressing my gratitude to the individuals who nurtured both of you from a very young age, the women in your lives, starting with Judge Henderson, Grandma Estelle Herring, or Mama Stella, carried a very important role in the church where she was known as Mother Herring. And your mother, Judge Henderson, Yanzi Henderson, I know how proud she was of you. And Judge Alsip, your mother, Jewel Alsip, all the sacrifices that these people made for you and your sister, Walana, who the book is dedicated to. And lastly, the mentors, your college football coach, Judge Henderson, um, Marienthal. Mike Marienthal. Mike Marienthal. Right. And Brad Bishop, the coach of the debate team, and what a huge difference these people made. John Doerr, of course, we didn't have too much time to talk about um, John Doerr tonight, but that'll be for another time. So thank you again so much for the privilege and honor to be here with all of you tonight. Thank you to the Northern District Court, to all of our judges, and to go out and enjoy the reception. I hope to have a moment to say hello to you outside. What? I didn't do questions. Uh, I am so remiss. We have time for questions. I got so carried away. Please have a seat. We'll take a few moments for questions. Uh, we have a mic. And my apologies. I got carried away. Oh, they're going to ask questions. I'm going to take a I have a mic. Anybody have any questions? There's a question right here. Uh, th this isn't a question, it's a comment. I'm Lynn Burke Porter, Judge uh, Alsop and I uh, grew up in Mississippi in the segregated schools around the same time. We went to different segregated schools, but <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're there. Uh, the comment at Mississippi State, the um, second African-American man to speak on campus was in um, 1968, uh, James Brown uh, performed there <laughs> in 1968 following uh, Dr. Aaron Henry's um, speaking there that my father and several others drove from this little town that I grew up in to be there. And I had not known until recently of your involvement in, um, uh, in that, and I want to thank you uh, for that. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Henderson and Judge Alsup, what do you attribute as the primary factors from, 18, from 1963 to 2019 that broke down the hearts and minds of Mississippians and others in the South? You first. Uh, well, I, I think 
You know, it, it's a good question because, as I said, I amazed at what I saw last week there as compared to 1963. And, uh, you know, one of the things uh, I think that history has not given the Kennedys sufficient credit for having the brilliant insight to focus on voting, put all of the resources of the Civil Rights Division on voting on those three states, because as Aaron Henry predicted, they saw this too, that if you give the blacks the franchise, uh, they'll vote the, ra the rascals out, the segregationists, and things will change, and that's exactly what's happened. I think that's been the change, and uh, we had an interesting uh, discussion, Bill's friend, Danny Cupid, who is a very committed, very bright man, uh, when we were asked to sum up our comments at Ole Miss last Wednesday night, uh, he said there has been progress made, there's been a lot of progress made, but he was admonishing his fellow Mississippians, but we still have to have a change on our attitudes, on our general feelings about these, because a lot of people are complying but not really doing it in a heartfelt way and they're not, they aren't won over as Bill has been won over. But uh, that's good enough for now, I guess, because uh, things have changed as Dr. King had predicted they would uh, with the, the change of the law. But I, I think it's just been the force of the federal government, the laws that have made them and, and uh, enforcing the laws that have been act, acted. A lot of people uh, don't agree with it, and there's a lot of resistance. But again, what I saw was working. Blacks and whites living together, eating together, working together there. And from the picture I got of it, it's, uh, it's going in the right direction. My comment's pretty close to that. I, that wall of segregation that existed, say, in 1963, it took a lot of blows to knock that down. It's kind of like the Berlin Wall. It took a lot of blows to knock that down. Without any question, the, the strongest blow were the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, and the Fair Housing Act in 68. Those were huge, but also huge at that time period was the moral force of the whole Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. which was completely peaceful. Uh, on the African-American side. And the, that peacefulness uh, and steady protest and the violent reaction by, say, that happened in Birmingham, it helped educate the America, even people in Mississippi, as to the cruelty of what was going on. Mm -hmm. So the moral force of the Civil Rights Movement was another thing. As time has gone on, America has become a mobile society where we routinely move around the country, but that was not true back then. It was very insulated, insular, and travel was rare. So people would grow up in this localized or regionalized life. But to answer your question, a smaller part of what has knocked down that wall has been the um, the dialogue, the national conversation that we see on TV, that we see in travel, so that we uh, no longer just have people in Mississippi talking with people in Mississippi, but it's a national conversation. And that is also uh, moderated the views uh, in Mississippi. Um, I think, let me just finish with two, two points. I think uh, on the fronts of education, I'm sorry, uh, employment, voting, public accommodations, uh, the progress has been remarkably good. On the problem of uh, the uh, edu education, we still have segregation in the public schools in Mississippi, but it's true also in Oakland for example, so it's not just a Mississippi problem. And there is, uh, I think this is what uh, Judge Henderson was referring to, 
there has been a uptick is maybe not quite the right word uptick in white supremacy in America at large not in Mississippi too I'm sure but at large in the in our country we have had say in the last eight to nine years an uptick in that is after several decades where it seemed to be going receding it's now seems to be uh, exiting so um, that's my uh, overall answer to that question. Um, one quick question. I think you just um, opened the door to what I was going to ask, which was your respective uh, views with regards to race relations as they existed in 2008 with the election of our first black president to then on the heels of two terms to have our current president, and now as we get ready to elect and have a new presidential election, just your sense of the status of race relationships in 2008, uh, 2016, and where we're headed in 2020. I, you gotta forgive me because I, I hear cases and I can be, uh, I have to be careful what I say uh, uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at what I said a moment ago. I think we've had an uptick in white supremacy in recent years, not, not just the last three years, but even before that. For, for example, that shooting in uh, the church in Charleston was, I believe, June of 2015. Uh, it's disturbing that we, that, that after all this effort and all the people who died uh, as a result of trying to make the place better, that we, we have that resurgence. But I, I don't want to talk about presidential politics. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe Judge Henderson is, feels freer to do that, so. <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure. Uh, my hearing aid isn't where I'm not sure I heard. <laughs> Not sure I heard the question, but let me let me make a stab at it. I will forever carry with me uh, Martin Luther King's uh, uh, statement that uh, the progress of the movement he was involved in had a history of two steps forward and one step backward, and uh, I think that uh, the election of uh, uh, Barack Obama was two giant steps forward, and we are now taking a giant leap backwards uh, that's probably in part in response to that. I think there are a number of our citizens who uh, don't like the idea of what our country is being, becoming uh, black presidents and things like that. Uh, but I think we'll recover from that and we'll take two steps forward. And I just have to believe that uh, that's the way we're going. All right. Um, so Judge Henderson and Judge Alsop, you, you both came up and uh, practiced law in a very difficult uh, time in our country's history. And now I think it's fair to say that we're in a very difficult time right now. So I have a two-part question. First, do you both still have hope for us as Americans, for our legal profession, and for our country? And if so, what words of encouragement do you have for those of us in the general public and those of us practicing law in these difficult times? Well, I'm by nature an optimist, so yes, I have hope. Uh, and uh, I think it's justified. I think that, uh, you know, just looking at my own lifetime and my own story, uh, I often will tell young people when I was in law school, if I told my classmates, I'm going to be a federal judge someday, they'd have probably called and had me put in a straitjacket uh, because there'd never been a federal judge in the United States. Now there are, and uh, now I'm a federal judge, and my law clerk behind me sitting up there is a federal judge, 
and there are a lot of federal judges in the country. And in 1963, if I had said, talking to Martin Luther King, uh, you know, uh, out that day with the ice cream cones, you know, I'm going to go back here in some years from now, and there's going to be a hotel down the street, it's integrated, and blacks are going to own it, and they're going to work in it. And we, It would have been a strange thought, but that's the truth now. So yes, we're, we're making progress, and anyone who says we aren't is, just doesn't get it. Uh, we're making progress, we're, and King predicted it, that we might not, you know, the will, the acts will be there, but maybe the, the sentiment behind it isn't there. It's done reluctantly, but that's a part of the process. And so I'm, I'm an optimist. I think we'll get there. It's slow, and uh, it'll go in the two steps forward and one step backward, but I think my grandson will see a far different world than I'm seeing now. I couldn't improve on what Judge Henderson said. I totally agree with him. I am old enough to have seen a lot in my lifetime and to remember that era and to remember how bad things were at one point in our country. And we are so far beyond that now that uh, I totally believe the future is bright. So don't give up hope. Um, and this is for Judge Alsop, although I'm not asking it in your role as a judge. I feel comfortable asking this only because you referenced being a young Democrat in Mississippi, but with L LBJ's famous comment after the Civil Rights Act and all those great civil rights laws that passed during his term, he said, well, now the Democrats have lost the South, and it appears by now that we have, and I'm just wondering, you being from the state of Mississippi, what your thoughts are on that, Mentioned that since you mentioned you were a Democrat, at least at that stage. That was 1966 when those memos were written, and uh, Nixon had not yet come up with the Southern strategy. That was two years later. But we were right on the cusp of that at the time, and it was inevitable because once President Kennedy, in June of 63, proposed the Civil Rights Bill, uh, and then, of course, when Lyndon Johnson a year later proposed the Voting Rights Bill, uh, the Democrats were really dead meat in the, among whites in the South. The Democratic uh, 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 strategy had to count on something else. They could still count on Texas for LBJ because he was from, LB, uh, from Texas, but, but otherwise the South was going to go the other way. And, it, it would, uh, and that's, that's why Nixon came up with the Southern strategy the, in terms of presidential politics, that's the answer, but in terms of local politics, there are a vast numbers of counties, including my hometown now, where almost every elected official is an African American. So in terms of local politics, the uh, demographics have finally won out in the, uh, uh, there, thanks to the Voting Rights Act. So there, we don't hear much about that, but in terms of local government, it's very true that African Americans are in charge of everything from the fire department to the, to the police, to the city council. Um, they have not yet elected a, we came close in Mississippi when Mike Espy was just running for governor, and he came pretty close, but he did not make it last time. But I think that will happen in Mississippi in a, Maybe in seven or eight years, we'll, we'll see that change. That's my comment. Somebody over here and uh, raise their hand. Yes. Thank you very much to all three of you for sharing this time with us. Um, I agree with you uh, about the education issue still remaining, but I also think a very critical issue is the criminal justice system, mass incarceration. Um, I wonder if you could provide any comments and insights or solutions to the extent that you can. Delton? Uh, <laughs> I heard incarceration. Uh, there, can you repeat, can you tell me what? The question is, what, well, uh, in terms of 
race discrimination in the criminal justice system, what are our views? I think it is very bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, there's a lot. It, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's shameful, uh, the mass incarceration, the uh, effect it's had on people's futures and families and lives. Uh, and I'm so glad that there's uh, so much attention uh, being paid to this now. Uh, I haven't figured out in my own mind uh, the cause of it. I think some of it's intentional, but I, I think that uh, uh, Some of it is, is uh, I think Eva Patterson's here, and she's done a lot of work on implicit bias. And I think a lot of it is just, uh, particularly judges, uh, seeing uh, uh, a person of color there, uh, inarticulate, uh, having committed a crime, and uh, a white person committing an equal crime, but uh, having family there and lawyers and uh, being articulate and relating to the judge, I think that has uh, ended up with a lot of uh, unequal sentencing, just that kind of a thing. And uh, we need to, uh, we need to uh, turn that around. We need to change our practices about incarceration. I, I came with the conclusion, and I guess I can talk about this now that I'm no longer a judge. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Don Spector, who runs the prison law office, has uh, gotten some money together, and he's taking prison officials from this country to other countries in Europe where they treat uh, people much, in a much more humane way, and they have rehabilitation and all of those things, and they treat their prisoners differently. When I was in law school, they taught us that the purposes of the criminal justice system was to, to punish uh, and to rehabilitate and to teach lessons uh, to them. Uh, and rehabilitation this has disappeared over these years. There is no rehabilitation. They're warehoused. And in fact, uh, I strongly believe that our prisons are criminogenic. And when I was sentencing people, if I thought they were salvageable at all, I would try not to send them to prison, but give them rehabilitation. And if it was drugs, send them to Delancey Street or something that could deal with the drug problem because they aren't really criminals at that point. I mean, they've committed a crime, but they're not criminal. But when they get in these prisons, they become criminals. They learn how to be criminals, and they have to, they have to join gangs uh, in order to stay alive. And uh, I've heard of instances where uh, people are getting out of prison. We wonder about the ridiculously high recidivism rate in California, and Tom Hayden, who has studied this over the years, a number of years ago came to me with some stories, one of which I remember is that when prisoners are getting out after having been protected by a gang, uh, they're made to pay the debt, and they'll say, okay, you're getting out, you're going over to the, uh, uh, you're going over to about the neighborhood I know, you're going to Berkeley, and there's a there's a Wells Fargo bank on the corner of College and uh, Ashby, and you rob that bank and you turn over the receipts here, and that's that they go back into jail right away. And if they don't pay that, their lives are in danger. So our system, we, we need to make mass changes. And my biggest criticism of the prison system is that we treat our prisoners of color not as people who will come back amongst us, but others who ought to be kept off the street as long as possible. And in Norway and Sweden and many of the countries, they treat their prisoners as one of us who will come back and live amongst us. And that makes a huge difference. 
as to how they're treated. We need to have more of that. Well, thank you so much. We've, we've run over our time. I hope you join us for the